In this video, I'm going to look at the inheritance of ABO blood groups and show you the importance of compatibility in blood donations. I'm also going to focus on the inheritance of sets linked traits such as hemophilia and red green color blindness. So if you need help in this area, keep watching. Okay, let's look at code dominance, the inheritance of ABO blood groups. So this is kind of similar to the inheritance of flower color where we looked at a complete dominance where you had a mixture of the traits. Now in ABO blood groups co-dominance you have two dominant alleles that are going to be expressed together. So it's not so much the mixture but more of each of the alleles are being expressed at the same time. So with ABO blood groups we have one gene which is represented by three different alleles. So we have the allele A, B, and O. Now you must understand that A and B are both dominant to O, which is the recessive allele. So we have A and B dominant alleles, O is the recessive allele. So therefore if A comes with an O, A has the overriding effect over the O. If B comes with an O, B would have the overriding effect over O. Now the next point to understand is that there's no dominance between A and B. So if A and B come together, and this is what I meant about being expressed together, these two alleles, yes they're dominant when they come with the O, but if they come together A and B, they coexist and they're expressed together. So let's look at the, the different possibilities for blood types. So there are only four blood types. We have blood type A, blood type B, AB, and O. And here you see that for blood type A, there are two possible genotypes an individual can have. So they can be heterozygous for blood type A, meaning that they have the A allele coming with the O allele. So we see that the A is going to be dominant over O, hence why the blood type A would be expressed. Secondly, we have the homozygous genotype, so two A alleles, so obviously the individual would definitely have blood type A. So that is for blood type A. Similarly now for blood type B, we have two possible genotypes. We have BO, heterozygous, so B is dominant over O, and then we have the homozygous form BB. Now for blood type AB, the only possible genotype would be AB. So you have the A allele and the B allele coming together and being expressed together. And then the final blood type O, we have two O alleles. So the only time someone can become, can actually have blood type O is if they inherit two recessive alleles from each parent. So a recessive allele from their mother and a recessive allele from their father. So another way of expressing these blood types, you may also come across the genotypes being illustrated with eyes, the letter eyes, and then you have the actual alleles attached to them. So this is an alternative form of expressing the genotype. So here we're seeing the homozygous form, so the two A's attached to each of the eyes, or it may be the heterozygous form where you have the I with the A attached, and the common letter I the common I represents the O allele. So this will produce the phenotype blood type A. And then similarly for blood type B, you're seeing how we have the two capital I's with the B alleles attached to each I. Now the heterozygous form would be the capital I with the B attached and then the I, remember the little I, common I represents the O. Now similarly here with AB, we're seeing one of each A and a B attached to each of the I's. So therefore someone who is blood type O now, the last blood type, we're seeing that the two common I's would come. So this is just an alternative way of expressing the ABO blood groups. So either way can work. Either way can work. So I thought it would be good to give you some information about the ABO blood groups in terms of what exactly A, B, and O stand for. So we know that there are four different blood groups, four different blood types, 
and these are based on the presence or absence of certain antigens on the surface of the red blood cells. So generally, our body cells would carry protein molecules attached to the surface of the cell, the cell membrane. So what you're seeing here are red blood cells carrying specific antigens on the surface. So if you examine the person that has type A, group A blood type, what you're seeing is A antigens attached to the red blood cell. So as you can see here, the A antigen represented by the pink circles. So that pretty much means that this individual can only receive blood from a type A individual. Because what would happen is that if they receive blood from a type AB or type B individual, their body is producing anti-B antibodies. So antibodies are produced um, as a form of immune response against anything that is foreign. So what you have to think of is that blood being received from a donor that is not compatible with this blood type A, the individual's blood is going to release antibodies against that particular antigen. So therefore, if someone who is blood type A receives blood from someone who is blood type B, the antibodies that are produced in this individual would be against blood type B. So hence why we have anti-B antibodies shown here. So a person that is blood type A cannot receive blood from a person that is blood type B or AB. So similarly with blood type B, as you can see, the antigens on the surface of the red blood cell are different. So these are B antigens represented by the blue diamonds. So those are attached to the red blood cells um, cell membrane. So if this individual was to receive blood from someone who is type A or type AB, remember that they are going to produce antibodies against the a antigens. So they have anti-A antibodies producing against those antigens because they're technically going to be considered foreign to the individual's body because they're not matching. They're not compatible with the antigens expressed on the red blood cell surface. So a group B person can only receive blood from a group B person or a group O individual. Now coming on to the group AB, now, group AB individuals are known as the universal recipients. They can actually receive blood from any individual, whether it's group A, group B, or group O, because they have a combination of the antigens on their red blood cell. So they have both the A antigens and the B antigens. So therefore, they're not going to produce any antibodies against these antigens because they have both. So if they receive blood from a type A person, type B, and then also the type O, it's not going to have any immune response. So group AB is known as the universal recipient because they can receive blood from any person. Now group O is special in the fact that it does not even carry any antigens on the surface. So you see that there are no special shapes there attached, meaning that there's no special antigens. There are no antigens attached to the cell membrane of the red blood cell. So therefore, they now are going to produce both anti-A and anti-B antibodies. So they cannot receive blood from group A, group B, group AB. Neither of those blood types will be compatible for someone who is group A. But they can be the universal donor, they're known as the universal donor because they can donate blood to any other blood type, to any other individual with all of the other blood types. So that is just a little background information as it relates to blood donation and compatibility and what exactly the A, B and O stands for. So let's go on to look at how blood groups are actually inherited. So let A represent the allele for blood type A. B is going to represent the allele for blood type B. 
and of course Po is going to represent the allele for blood type Po. Now if we have parental phenotypes that are blood type A and type B, so let's say the father is blood type A and the mother is blood type B, and then it says that the genotypes, that they're both heterozygous, that means that the father, his genotype would be AO, and the mother, her genotype would be BO. So let's look at this punit square here and see how exactly the children would inherit the different blood types. So we have the father AO and the mother is BO. So we're just simply going to match up as usual. So the A from the father combines with the B from the mother, giving us the first child having the blood type AB. So the genotype is AB and the phenotype is type AB. The second child inherits the B allele from the mother, well, they inherit the O allele from the father. So this child is heterozygous for type B. So the genotype is BO and the phenotype is type B. The third child inherits the A allele from the father, well, they inherit the O allele from the mother. So making this child heterozygous for blood type A. So the genotype is AO and the phenotype is type A. And then the final child would inherit both the O alleles from each of the parents. So from the father and the mother. So this makes this individual type O. So the genotype is OO and the phenotype is type O. So therefore the phenotypic ratio of the children of the offspring are as follows. So there's one for each. So one type AB, one type B, one type A, and one type O. So that is how ABO blood groups are inherited. So this basically shows you that parents can have completely different blood types to their children. It is possible. As you can see, only two of the children, two of the four children, actually share the blood types of the parents. So AB and O would be unique in terms of not being similar to either of the parents. So that is it on the inheritance of ABO blood groups. All right, let's take a look at sets linked traits. So these traits, these characteristics would be inherited a little differently to what we would have been doing before with complete dominance and incomplete dominance and co-dominance. Now in this case, we're involving the sets chromosomes. So we have X and we have Y. Now the genes that are carried on the X chromosome, those are the sets linked genes. So those are the genes you're going to be focusing on. So typically an X chromosome is much larger than a Y chromosome. So therefore you tend to have more genes being carried on the X chromosome as opposed to the Y chromosome. So the particular traits we're going to focus on would be hemophilia and color blindness. These are two genetic disorders that are considered to be sex linked because the defective genes are carried on the X chromosome. So basically, males are more likely to show sex-linked conditions because simply, they only need to inherit an X chromosome with the recessive allele and automatically they will become affected with whatever condition it is. So looking at the diagram here, this male is obviously the one that has the condition because he would have inherited the defective chromosome, the X chromosome with the defective allele from his mother. So some um, a male is easily going to inherit sex linked conditions because they only need one X chromosome with the defective allele. So in this case, the mother is a carrier, meaning she is heterozygous. So she has an X chromosome with the normal allele and an X chromosome with the defective alleles. So only females can be considered carriers. So we're going to dig into this a little deeper as we go on to look at the individual conditions, hemophilia and color blindness. So let's now look at the inheritance of hemophilia. So hemophilia is a blood clotting disorder. It's a genetic disorder that prevents the blood from clotting when the individual gets a cut. So basically the problem is a defective gene and it leads to the prevention of the production of clotting factor eight or nine. So generally in our blood, 
So you should have an understanding of the blood clotting process and there are clotting factors in the blood that would allow the blood to clot when um, a wound is formed. So the defective gene would prevent this clotting from occurring. So that is the problem with hemophilia. So therefore the individual just continuously, continuously bleeds out when they get a wound. Now let's look at how this is inherited. So we're going to use the letter H to represent the gene for this um, condition. So either normal blood clotting or hemophilia. So we're seeing here that the capital H is the dominant allele for normal blood clotting. So you should expect that when this capital H is attached to an X chromosome, that would signify, represent that normal blood clotting should occur. Now, little h would represent the recessive allele for hemophilia. So therefore, in order for a person to be hemophilic, first of all, in order for a male to be hemophilic, it just needs to inherit the X chromosome with this particular recessive allele attached to it. Now, a female, she can only be hemophilic if she inherits two X chromosomes with this recessive allele. So let's look at it in a little more detail. So I have the range of genotypes that individuals can have. So we have the different genotypes and their corresponding phenotypes. So the first one is a normal female. So she's gonna have normal blood clotting. So the only reason she has normal blood clotting is because she inherits both X chromosomes carrying the dominant allele for normal blood clotting. So she would have inherited the X chromosome from her mother and another X chromosome from her father. Both of them are carrying the dominant allele. So she is going to be normal blood clotting. Now the next individual is a male. So he's normal blood clotting as well. And he has the X chromosome carrying the dominant allele attached to it. Now the, the third individual here is a female who is a carrier. So she is a carrier because she's heterozygous for normal blood clotting. So she has normal blood clotting because she has that dominant allele attached to one of her X's. And then she's a carrier because she's also carrying the recessive allele. So remember the dominant allele has the overpowering effect over the recessive allele. So although she's carrying both alleles, the dominant allele is going to overpower the recessive allele and is going to be expressed in the phenotype as normal blood clotting. Now the next individual is a male and he is a hemophiliac because his X chromosome which he inherited from his mother is carrying the recessive allele. So he's going to experience the excessive bleeding of the genetic condition. So this is a hemophilic male and the hemophilic male as I would have talked about earlier because, because he only needs to inherit the X chromosome with the genetic defect, the defective gene, right away he is going to become hemophilic. Now on the last individual, this is a female and in order for a female to be hemophilia, she needs to inherit both X chromosomes carrying both the recessive allele. So you're seeing the recessive allele attached to each X chromosome. So in other words, this female who is hemophilia, she would have inherited the X chromosome from her mother and an X chromosome from her father. And each of them are carrying the recessive allele. So these are the different options, the different genotypes that an individual can have. So let's look at the actual punet square for this. So if we have a, a genetic cross that has a normal father mating with a carrier mother. So we have our punet square set up as shown. So the normal father, X, carrying the dominant allele for normal blood clotting and Y. So always remember that the Y does not have anything attached. So we are only focusing on the X chromosome and the genes attached to the X chromosome. So the father is a normal blood clotting person. So he is carrying the dominant allele for normal blood clotting. Now look at the mother. Her genotype is X, capital H, X, little h because she is a carrier that's what is said in the phenotype so carriers are heterozygous so they're going to have a dominant allele and a recessive allele so now we're just going to do the normal matching up like what we do all the time 
So the X chromosome from the mother matching with the X chromosome from the father, and both of them are dominant alleles that are attached to the X chromosome. So therefore making this individual a normal blood clotting female. The second individual inherits the X chromosome from her, his mother. So we know it's a male. So the X chromosome comes from the mother and the Y chromosome is coming from the father. So this X chromosome has a dominant allele attached to the X, therefore making this a normal blood clotting male. The third child is inheriting the X chromosome with the dominant allele from the father. So let's look at it. So here, the father is carrying the X chromosome with the dominant allele. And we're matching it with the X chromosome from the mother who is carrying the recessive allele. So as usual, we always put the capital letter first. So the dominant allele will usually go first. So the X chromosome carrying the dominant allele for normal blood clotting and then the X chromosome carrying the recessive allele for hemophilia. So this individual is a female carrier or carrier female, but she is going to have normal blood clotting. So she's not going to express the, the symptoms of the disease, the signs of the disease. So although she has a recessive allele, she's just carrying the particular recessive allele, but her phenotype would be normal blood clotting. So her genotype is heterozygous. She's known as a carrier but she is going to be having normal blood clotting. She doesn't actually have the genetic condition, the actual disease. Now the last child is a male because he inherits the X chromosome from his mother, which is carrying the recessive alley for hemophilia. And obviously he's inheriting the Y chromosome from the father. So this is a hemophilic male. So in order for the male to be hemophilic, as I said before, he just has to inherit that X chromosome, one X chromosome with the recessive allele. So in order for a female, so going back here, so it, it is less likely to see um, female hemophiliacs compared to male hemophiliacs in a population. In other words, you're gonna see more males with hemophilia than females because it's easier to inherit. The male just has to inherit one X chromosome with the defective allele. The female needs to inherit two X chromosomes with the defective allele. All right, so that is the inheritance of hemophilia. All right, let's now look at another example of a sex link trait, red, green, color blindness. So the problem with this condition is that there's a defective gene that affects the development of cone cells, which are found in the eye's retina. So the retina is found at the back of the eye and it usually consists of cone cells and rod cells. Now, the cone cells are responsible for allowing you to see color, especially when um, bright light is available, so you can differentiate between different colors. While the rod cells, they're the ones that would allow you to see in the dark when there's not much light available, so you would only be able to like, make out colors like white and black and gray. Now, the problem with the individual who has inherited um, red green color blindness their gene this defective gene prevents them from developing the cone cells as normal so as you can see in the picture here an individual with red green color blindness they have a problem with seeing the colors green and red so if you're looking at these apples the colorblind individual is seeing the apple all practically almost the same so they don't have any problem seeing the yellow but they have a problem seeing the green and the red so the red, the green apple and the red apple just looks a little darker, a um, little brownish tint as opposed to looking green as it should and red as it should. So that is the problem with red green color blindness. So the cone cells are not properly developed to allow the individual to see these two different colors properly. All right, let's look at how this is inherited. So it's the same concept as the inheritance of hemophilia. So we're going to let capital C represent the dominant allele for normal vision. And then we're going to have the letter, the little c, representing the recessive allele for color blindness. So therefore, so let's look at the possible genotypes and phenotypes an individual can have. So a normal vision male, his genotype would be X, 
capital C, so the dominant allele attached to the X chromosome, and then Y. So that is a normal vision male. The colorblind male it has to inherit the X chromosome carrying the recessive allele, which is the common letter C, attached to the X chromosome. So that is a colorblind male's genotype. Now, a female with normal vision, both of her X chromosomes are going to be carrying the dominant allele. So obviously, that's why she's going to be seen as normal. Now, a normal vision female who is a carrier, so you can see once again, this female has both the dominant allele and the recessive allele. So one X chromosome with the dominant allele, so that's capital C, and then one X chromosome with the recessive allele. Now, the colorblind female, so therefore, once again, we can see that in a population, there are going to be more males with colorblindness than females because they only took one X chromosome with the defective allele to make this individual colorblind, to make this male colorblind. Now, a female needs to inherit two X chromosomes, each of them carrying the recessive allele. So it's the same concept as with hemophilia. Just that we're looking at a different condition. We're using different letters to represent the, the condition. So let's look at the Punet square and the inheritance of color blindness. So we have a color blind father mating with a normal vision mother. Now remember, a normal vision mother can either be heterozygous, as you see in here, a carrier. Or she could be normal vision, homozygous for normal vision, carrying both dominant alleles. So in this case, we are going to use the homozygous form. So this normal vision mother is homozygous for being able to see normally. So she's having two dominant alleles attached to her X chromosomes. So we're doing the usual matchup. So the X from the mother matching with the X from the father. And as you can see, the father is who's carrying the colorblind allele, the recessive allele for colorblindness. So this is going to produce a daughter who is going to be a carrier. So she's a carrier female because she has the dominant allele attached to this X chromosome she got from her mother. And then this X chromosome she got from her father is going to be carrying the recessive allele. So this is a carrier female. And then the second child is going to be a male, XY. And his X has the dominant allele for normal vision. So this boy has gotten, has received the X chromosome from the mother. So therefore, he is going to be a normal vision male. Because that X chromosome from the mother is carrying the dominant allele for normal vision. And the next two children are the same. We have another carrier female and another normal male. So we're simply just matching up each of the each of the sets chromosomes from the mother and the father. So that pretty much completes the inheritance of red green color blindness and in total the sex link traits. So hopefully you have a better understanding of how sex link traits are inherited. So in the next video, we're going to look at part three of inheritance of traits, and we're going to focus on pedigree charts so you can see the genetic history within a family and see how particular traits are inherited. If you found this video helpful, feel free to subscribe, like, and share. And don't forget to hit that notification bell.